I didn't exist. Legally, I didn't exist. I had no birth certificate, no social security number, no doctor's records, no school records. My dad was very particular on who we talked to. If we told the wrong people we were going to Ecuador, that like the government could take us away. And he was constantly afraid that because he knew about this, that he was going to get hunted down. Wow. He said cults aren't bad because cults just mean follower of one and so technically we're a cult but that's not a bad thing i there were hours of the day where i just had to put my head in my hands because anytime i looked at someone i was getting a intrusive thought so i thought i was going insane my parents told me this was normal and that i just needed to shake my head to get the bad thoughts away so that became a new compulsion oh no where i found out that i had depression and anxiety and PTSD and OCD and all of these things. And I'm like, oh, I am eternally screwed up. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. As always, if you're only listening and you want to see our faces, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can like, subscribe, join in on the conversation, leave those encouraging words for our guests. They do read the comments. It means so much that you guys are willing to offer so much support when they come on and share their stories. Also, quick announcement, we did officially launch our our C2C vacation. We did a whole live about it. You can go check that out in our previous videos and we'll link in the description below where you can go and book. So today's guest, she reached out to me with her personal story. There's so much to this one. So it's been a while since we've actually talked about just a family cult, a very insulated isolated incident, if you will. However, her dad was part of the Embassy of Heaven cult, which kind of informed his decisions. He ended up believing that he was a prophet. He moved his family from state to state to state to avoid CPS because he was also very paranoid. They even moved into different countries, ended up in a Mennonite colony at one point, and she just barely got out like six, seven months ago. So this is very fresh. Uh, we are going to be taking this very slow talking about the way that she grew up and all of the hardships that came with that. So thank you so much for joining us, Ella. Thank you. I'm really excited. Yeah, I was excited when you reached out. I mean, you just turned 18, right? I did. I turned 18 in June. So I left like three months before I turned 18. Oh my goodness. And you are coming to us from Ecuador currently. I am. Yep. Okay. That was one of the places my dad decided to take us. Okay. Yeah, we have a lot to cover. So I guess where we could start is from your birth because it's kind of an interesting birth story. And then we'll just pop around through your childhood and, and see where we go. Okay. Yeah. So basically with my birth, it was really interesting. Um, I'm my parents' first biological child from both. I have some two foster sisters and then two older siblings that were a part of my dad's older family, like the family before me. So I was born in Minnesota to a midwife because my father was extremely paranoid of government, he thought, and the hospitals. He thought that they would kill us or I don't even know. It kind of always changed. When I was born, I was given a birth certificate, but I was given a birth certificate called the Kingdom of Heaven birth certificate that stated that I was born in the Kingdom of Heaven. Okay. And so I was not given any proper documentation. I was actually a high risk pregnancy. I'm not exactly sure what it was, uh, but from what my mom has told me, it was like my placenta and umbilical cord were attached improperly so that if at any moment I would have pulled, um, then I would have killed me and her, especially because we didn't go to hospitals. Mm. Um, so I should say that me being a couch potato saved me in her life, mine in her <laughs> lives. So, <laughs> yeah. So I was born then, and we lived in Minnesota just for a couple years, and we had to leave because my foster sisters that I previously mentioned. I'm not really going to go into much of their story because it's not mine, but they were. The court demanded that we give them back because there was accusations of abuse. Mm. 
Mm. And I can say that, yes, there was some physical abuse as well as emotional abuse Okay. with that. Um, so when I was two, we went to Oklahoma uh, and we finally did give the ki- girls back. And they would have been like 14 and 11. I would have been about four. And then after that, we moved to a five acre property hour and a half away from the nearest Walmart. That is where I grew up. And for most of the time that I was on that property, like I would have been like four to seven. I did not wear clothes. I wore flip flops and underwear unless it was winter. So I didn't think much of that detail, but I have been told by friends that that's not normal. So. And why do you think that is? Were you just not provided clothes by your parents? Did they just want you to be free? Was there a reason behind that really? I'm not sure. Um, My parents stated that, well, because we got our water from the river, we didn't get it. We didn't have running water. Our power was from generators. So they said it was easier to wash children than it was to wash clothes. Oh. And yes, we did live in Oklahoma, which meant it got very, very hot. So yes, while I was in Oklahoma, I had no formal education. I think my mom taught me how to read. That's it. So I would have been seven when we left there. I'm sorry, where are you in the lineup again of children? I am the firstborn of both my parents. Okay. So I'm the oldest. I do have older siblings, but they left the girls, like left when I was four, and my older brothers left before I was born years. Like they're in their 40s. Okay. So were you an only child then within your family at that point? No, at that point I was... The oldest of three total. Oh, got it. So one thing that happened that was kind of important that happened in Oklahoma was, so my mom ended up getting pregnant with my youngest brother. And when she was five months along, my dad thought that we needed to leave the country. We were researching countries we could move to, and we found Ecuador because they have a law that if the sibling is born there, they get citizenship and their direct family gets permanent residency. So my mother at seven months pregnant flew to Ecuador with her midwife and my older brother for three months to give birth. And during the time period, I was six, almost seven. She came back on my seventh birthday. My dad, all he did was write a letter to request asylum to the Ecuadorian government because the US government was persecuting us. So that means my dad was working eight hours a day. I, like I said, I was young, so, but it was all day. And I just remember being like six and going into the pantry because we lived in a trailer. Um, being like, it was a nice trailer though. <laughs> going, what can I make for my siblings? I'm six. All I know how to make is eggs. So that was like three months of that when I was six. Oh my gosh, that's a lot to handle. Can we talk about your dad for a little bit? Because I want to get into yeah. his mindset, his mentality, why he's doing the things that he's doing, These, if he's prophesying anything because you said he claimed that he was a prophet. At this point, are you noticing anything at six years old that feels, looking back now, feels different? At six, no. Most of my childhood memories as a, until recently are all in third person which I know now is due to the trauma, but at six years old, no, I don't remember. I just remember at six that my dad was very particular on who we talked to and that like, if we told the wrong people we were going to Ecuador, that like the government could take us away. And I knew that my dad wasn't allowed to drive because he didn't have a license, but he drove anyway, but he would never drive with us in the car. Okay. So that's at six. That's all I knew. So you had mentioned in your video to me that you were fleeing different states because you were avoiding CPS. Yeah. Do you know why you were getting flagged by CPS? I think it was mainly due to my foster sisters. Oh, okay. I think that was the main reason um, because we were so young, uh, I didn't really know. I, I, I didn't have any documents. I didn't exist. Legally, I didn't exist. I had no birth certificate, no social security number, no doctor's records, no school records. As far as the government knew, unless, you know, they have some other way of noticing, I 
legally wasn't a person. And my three younger siblings were also in that same boat, except my littlest brother, who was born in Ecuador. Okay. Within the mindset of your dad, what are the things that you know of that he was learning from this other cult that he kind of adopted into your family that informed his decisions? He had the belief that he was a sovereign citizen. And so to give a little bit of not many people know about the sovereign citizens movement. So let me just give a little bit. Basically, they were people who claimed that the U.S. government after the Civil War, when they freed the slaves, didn't actually free the slaves. They made white people slaves, too. Interesting take. Mm -hmm. And so they believed that if they were to deny the government, like literally, they would get arrested and they would say, sorry, authorization denied because I'm not above this world. I'm not, I'm on United States land, but I am a member, I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So they had their own passports, birth certificates, license plates. Wow. Yeah. And they even have a pamphlet I, in the link. They have a website that's still online of like, what to do when you're arrested? What to do when the psych ward talks to you? <laughs> like legitimately. And so some members become lawyers. They claim to be lawyers so that they, like they don't go to the bar, they don't take anything, but they basically get these really old blacks law dictionaries from when they were valid because they believe that the law dictionaries that are modern are wrong and illegal. So they go there and they basically draw up all of these conclusions. Like if I have a lawyer in court, that means that I am claiming to be crazy, like that I can't represent myself. So that's just some of the things. Like they completely, so no marriage license, no license, no paying taxes, which yes, one of the members is in prison for that. So that was the type of movement. So my father, when we were born, he didn't want us to be slaves, right? So he gave us no documentation and he was constantly afraid that because he knew about this, that he was gonna get hunted down because the government doesn't want us to know that he knows because he's dangerous. And because the back in the 1990s, their property, the cult property, was raided by either the FBI, I think, because of uh, tax issues. It was some crime doing with that. So they raided and took their computers and things like that. And so my dad was terrified that that would happen again and that they would come and destroy our family. Okay. One thing I forgot that when I was six, I do remember waking up in the middle of the night to use the restroom and my dad was kneeling on the couch and muttering in a language. I don't know what it was. It was just, he was praying and muttering in some language and it, he does not speak more than one language. He's monolingual. So Right. Because I'm wondering then at what point this religious worldview kind of came into it, because it seems like the cult that he was a part of was very much just about politics and about government. But did they also have a very strong religious belief system? Yes. Their entirety, their entire basis was that we are not of this world. We are a part of God's heaven. As born again Christians, we are not of this world. So their ID said that they were from heaven. So I still have my birth certificate from that, that I didn't see until I moved out. And I'm, I'm like, kingdom of heaven? So what does that mean as far as, practically speaking, being in the world, coming from this kingdom of heaven? What do they believe, like theologically speaking? Christian based. Um, no, I don't know if everyone is Christian but I think the majority is. Some sovereign citizens are not Christian, but everyone in the embassy of heaven was. And then at what point did you realize your dad thought that he was a prophet? I started seeing things like that when I was nine, 10. Like he would say, God told me this. God told me that. Or he would imply it in the least. So like, I remember like my mom and him had just independently been researching England because apparently they wanted to move there, but they hadn't spoken to it about it with each other. And so when they came in and they had both been like, they found out they were both researching England. They're like, oh, this is God. 
And my dad had also thought that he had predicted when the end of the world would be, which was coincidentally 384 years from now. Oh, <laughs> that is, <laughs> that's um, convenient, right? <laughs> yes. And we had a lot of like, we had to read these. So you know the How to Train Up a Child book? Oh, yes. Very much. That was a part of my childhood. Oh. And I actually didn't realize that until after I watched your YouTube. And I go, wait, wait a second. And I asked my mom, I'm like, did we use this? And she's like, I think we may have. So it wasn't like the basis of my childhood, but it was the same. Okay. And for those who aren't familiar, we did a whole episode with Kendra and we talk about this book that is horrific. It's basically how to abuse your child to make them subservient to you within the guise of you just, you have to train them how to be obedient. And it's things like while the child is breastfeeding, if they bite you, you pull their hair or you pinch them or blanket training where you put your little pre-toddler infant on a blanket and put their favorite toys just outside of the blanket. And when they reach for the toy, you swat their hand away to teach them that they can't do anything without your permission, essentially. And so obviously, it's really problematic. It's like corporal punishment to the extreme. And so, oh, wow, you had to deal with that. Was that both of your parents that kind of use that form of discipline? So both of my parents did. I will say that when it came to physical abuse, this is something I just realized was um, because my spanking and my sibling spanking was not the same as other kids spankings, which I found out later. They'd be like, yeah, I got one swat. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, our minimum was 10. It would go up to 60. Wow. I just remember like that was a big part of my childhood. Like it, I was spanked least because I was, I figured out how to maneuver in my house. But my little brothers, like the amount of times I had to watch them just like get beat, essentially, especially when they were young, like they'd be like four years old. Wow. Like, I think one of my first memories actually was when I was two years old and I'd gotten into my mom's makeup and I was spanked like for that. And another memory I had is like when I was six, I was spanked so hard because I was arguing with my sister that I peed my pants. Mm. Yeah. So there was some of that. And I'm, I'm, to be clear, I'm not saying I was beat every day because I wasn't. Um, but there were instances of physical abuse. And you're also so isolated. Did you yeah. have any friends? Were you allowed to have friends? I thought so. But now as I talk to the friend that I've had for years, not really. When I was younger, I lived in Oklahoma. My only friends were my siblings. When we lived in a trailer park, or well, it was an RV park, not a trailer park. When we lived in an RV park, I did have some playground friends, but that's about the extent. And by the time I was 12, I met my best friend, Carrie Ann. Um, she is one of the best people I know, honestly. But I remember it was very hard for her to be friends with me because there were so many things she wasn't allowed to talk to me about, like a period or religion, really anything. Like she was not allowed to talk to me about it. about puberty, like my you, I'm 12. And she wasn't allowed to talk because she was Christian too, but she wasn't allowed to talk about her beliefs. We had to have a very one-sided relationship for years because she was forced to by my mother. Mm. And was it because they wanted to, I guess it would just be the extreme purity culture thing. They didn't want you to know about reproduction or your own anatomy. Was that the case? No, they did not want me to know. But uh, another thing about me is I have OCD. So for those who don't know, that's obsessive compulsive disorder. And it usually starts presenting when you're in early puberty. And so that's when it started presenting. And because of all of this basis that my parents had about the religious and like just terrified of sex, you're just terrified. They saw me just have breakdowns because I was constantly obsessing 
and compulsing over religious thoughts. Like there was one point where I was obsessing over the fact that I might be going to hell. What if I had blasphemed the Holy Ghost? Things like that. And so on one hand, it's like my parents, they didn't know what it was. They didn't know that this was a mental health issue. They thought maybe demons. Mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure what they thought. How did they help you? My mom, well, one of the compulsions I had was confess. I had to confess my sins. So I, I do feel bad for my mother because I definitely confessed so many sins to her. They weren't really sins, but I thought they were. And so I was just constantly confessing. And because I needed that anxiety relief, that relief from that anxiety. And with my dad, I remember telling him about it because it was so bad that I couldn't look at people. I, there were hours of the day where I just had to put my head in my hands because any time I looked at someone, I was getting an intrusive thought. So I thought I was going insane. My parents told me this was normal and that I just needed to shake my head to get the bad thoughts away. So that became a new compulsion. Oh, no. And yeah, that was that was fun. Wow. So... You weren't ever allowed to go see a mental health professional. I think you mentioned they didn't agree with doctors, so you never went to see the doctor or anything? No. Um, see, I've had health issues my whole life. Um, like, I've had a sinus infection, reoccurring sinus infection since I was eight. And I have knock knees, which means my knees bend inwards, which causes me to have knee, ankle, and hip pain. My parents, I don't know how to put this they saw this as too much sugar. So basically my entire childhood, it was different diets to fix me. Like typically they'd be without sugar. There was one diet when I was 12 that was a called the Jilly Juice Diet. And it was basically high, it was blended cabbage with cups of salt and water and it was fermented and we would drink it and it would cause you to get sick, like with chills. This is gross, but like we called it waterfalls. So like massive diarrhea, like just water. I later found out that it was probably an overdose on sodium, but my parents saw that as a detox and we did that every day for two months. Oh my gosh. Oh, that sounds awful. I've been doing some research into malnutrition and my family, my adopted family, they have been trying to get me to realize that I was not fed enough as a child. And I look back at my, I'll show people my baby or like my child pictures and I'll be like 10 and they'll be like, you look like you're six, things like that. So like I didn't get my period till I was 15, which is not exactly too normal. My mother, she was very cheap as not in a bad, like she was, I don't want to defend her, but I also don't want to make her worse than she seems. <sighs> my father was awful with money. He was just like, ah, let's spend, spend, spend. So my mother, to compensate for this, was very strict with the money that she was allowed to control, which was usually what we got. So like, we would go to the dentist sometimes, but I remember like when I was 12, I really didn't want my mom to have to pay for a cavity to be filled. I was, I think I was 12, yeah. Um, So it was slightly loose, not really. It was a baby tooth. So I said, you know what? And I went in the bathroom and I ripped my tooth out. Oh. And I went and I showed my mom, I was like, here, you don't have to pay the $20 for a filling because in Ecuador it's about 20 bucks. Man. She appreciated it. Just makes my stomach turn. You pulled out your tooth. Um, Yeah, actually, let's talk about Ecuador. What was that like moving from the States down to Ecuador and how did you feel about it? Did you enjoy it? Was it hard? Was it okay? Uh, Well, I was eight when I moved. So my first reaction was, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And so I loved it. Um, I will say that I, my siblings, they did better than I did. Like they went out in the street and played with Ecuadorian friends, really started to get, I'm not sure if it's depression or what. Um, I have depression now, but I'm not sure if I had it then. But I was about nine, and all I wanted to do was learn. That's all I wanted. So I just, 
we are we did have access to YouTube in my family, which is interesting considering most wouldn't, but we had access to YouTube and computers. So I just remember being fascinated with history. So like any war ever, I'm like, yes, I want to learn about this. Like the only reason I know anything about history or geography really is because I taught myself. Mm, because you still weren't allowed to go to school at this point. No, I remember when I was 10, I was in Ecuador and I was like, mom, all right, can I convince you to let me go to school? Granted, I will say the Ecuadorian school systems are not great. And also, I want to make it clear, I'm not against homeschooling. I'm really not. I'm against parents not teaching their kids. Mm -hmm. So I remember I went to them and I was like, I really want to go to school. And uh, they showed me a video of this girl who would have been abused by a satanic cult and said, this is what can happen if you go to school. Yikes. And by the end of it, I was like, no, I don't want to go to school. Don't, you can't make me go to school. Uh, so did they try to homeschool? They did. My mom did. Like she, something about my mom is when she was 29, she was hit by a drunk driver, which broke her C1 and C2. So she was in chronic pain and she did not take pain meds except for ibuprofen. And my dad was extremely controlling, constantly accusing her of cheating or being a Jezebel. I don't know if you've heard that term used uh -huh. <laughs> on the cult, cult thing, but my name's Jezebel. You know, my mom's name was Jezebel, essentially, when he really wanted to hurt us. We had books, like workbooks, and she sat down with us and really did try. So there were times where we taught, we learned and then there were other times, like when we got older and math became a problem, she kind of gave up in a way. And other things, like we learned basically the basics, which was reading and math. And I didn't take my first science class, really. I took one in fourth grade, but kind of. We had this call, system called SOS Schoolhouse, which is like this really old computer software homeschool thing that gives you like a whole curriculum and all the assignments and the lessons. And we only had it for fourth and eighth grade. What we did was I just took fourth grade twice, not because I was behind, but because we didn't have a fifth grade book. Oh. So I learned multiplication very well. When I when my sister was like 13, 12, 13, she was like, she wanted to learn too. We were both like, let's learn. I want to go to school, but we weren't allowed to go to school. So she found this online homeschooling co-op. And I can just say, thank you so much, little sis, for finding that. We basically were able to get actual classes. They were from volunteers and it was online for free. So I was able to take a biology course. I was able to take a government course and an economics course and some math. I will say also on another note, my mother believed that writing was really important. So she did actually get me a tutor, like who would for an hour once a week would help me write like research papers and things. So I did that for about a year and a half. So there was some effort. So was your mom okay with the online classes then? She was. My, oh, I also, I took a logic class. It was more of my dad who was kind of like, sure, like whatever, but he didn't like it because as time went on, my father got more and more into conspiracy theories and he became a flat earther. Mm. And I remember I'm like, dad, me and my sister, that's where we kind of drew the line. We're just like, really? And he was like, oh, you and your Christian science books. I don't like what these Christian scientists scientists are teaching you because mind you the school was also based like i am still christian but like this was based in christianity as well so it's not like we were taking some atheistic course from a public school we were already taking christian curriculum and he had a problem with it okay so yeah. you felt like you were gaining an education as you were getting older it seems like you started to recognize that something wasn't right as far as even being able to stand up to your dad and say, okay, dad, that's a little crazy. So did you have some outside influences that were kind of helping you see things in a different way? I did. Um, that would be my best friend, Carrie Ann and her family. Well, 
when COVID happened, my dad went extra crazy. We became nocturnal because he thought the quarantine was a possible excuse for the government to come and arrest people. So we became nocturnal. We had an escape plan for how to leave the house. We took a lot of vacations, quote, that were, we weren't allowed to tell anyone. So that's just like a little basis. And mind you, I have been friends with Carrie Ann since I was 12 years old. And from the ages of 12 to 14, my father was my legitimate superhero. And she would listen to me and she did her best not to say anything because she really wanted me to come to that conclusion myself. Right. Because she knew that if she said, hey, no, your dad's crazy abusive, also cult, then I wouldn't have listened. Yeah. I was 15 and I just remember I kept getting into fights with my dad. If you ask anyone in my life, I am a very easy teenager. I never snuck out. I didn't swear. I was the majority of the time respectful. I was just really easy in general. But the fact is that I had my own opinions and would say, no, this doesn't make sense, hissed my father off to no end. So he would get into screaming matches with me, more so him screaming at me. (laughs) But, you know, and I remember I was like 15 and I was like, I can't do this. Carrie Ann was there for me throughout all of it. Um, She still encouraged me to, she was like, all right, let's do this, but let's do this the right way. Because at that point, I still wasn't ready to say I wanted to leave. But I did tell her, I was like, okay, when I turn 18, I'm going to come visit you. Because she also lives in Ecuador. But we lived hours apart by this point. Because we kept moving around Ecuador, where she just went to the coast and stayed. I was like, all right, when I'm 18, I'm going to come visit you. And one thing that was really taboo in our household was talking about moving out. Like, for example, I was like 10 years old. And I was in the kitchen crying because I was cleaning the kitchen. I, you know, I was a 10 year old who was upset that she had to clean the kitchen. And I remember being like, when I'm an adult, I'm going to move out of this place. You know, normal for a kid to say that. My dad grabbed me by my shoulders and was like, you will never say that. Like, you will never say that. Don't you ever say that to me. So like us moving out terrified him. So that's the people who really helped me would be Carrie Ann and her family because now I I live with them and they are truly some of the best people I know. And I could be, I am so grateful for everything they did for me throughout the years. Yeah. But that, that answers your question. Yeah. Then at what point did you try to move into a Mennonite community? Oh, this is fun. Okay. So it was 2022. It was May. I was so happy. I was like getting a job. I was working, like I was working to save up to move out because I was like, I'm leaving. I am getting out of this hell hole so fast, which, you know, my father made me quit my job because I was too independent. But anyway, I had a new job lined up and my parents got contacted by a friend of the family saying, Hey, well, you know, they're missionaries in Mexico. And they're leaving their house to go to Africa to do some stuff there. Would you, and they said, Hey, do you guys want to come to live in our house for free and see a new country? Like these people were well-meaning. Like they were nice people. They were just like, Hey, I know you guys like seeing new places. You want to go? And so within one month of them getting that offer, we sold everything and moved. And this is in Mexico. Uh, This was, we, we moved to Mexico within one month. Right. I moved to Ecuador when I was eight and I stayed there until I was 16, almost 17 until I went to Mexico for nine months with one month notice. And the thing is, my dad was always making these predictions like, you know, this is going to happen by this time. (sighs) Like he thought the Ecuadorian government was going to force vaccinate everyone. So he was like, we need to leave the country. (laughs) We need to get out. And I remember being like, I don't think that's what they're saying. Cause like I was learning Spanish. So I was like, let me just send this clip that he was using to justify the whole move to my Ecuadorian friend. I was like, Hey, what does this mean? And she's like, I don't know what the heck he's saying, but he's not talking about that. They're not talking about forced vaccinations, but my dad could not believe it. So we moved and we had to have these, like this family meeting. 
because my dad loved family meetings. We need to leave. We need to do this because, and I was like, dad, do you know how many times we've left and like moved, gone to vacations, moved because you were scared we were going to get killed? I'm like, you think this government is so freaking powerful. You think that they have the ability to shut down the whole world just to arrest people like you. And you think that you can escape them. This isn't making sense. If they want you dead, they'll kill you. That's a good point. And I think this is all for naught. And oh my goodness, he felt so disrespected. He was like, oh my goodness, how dare you? Like, the only reason we haven't been killed is because I've been taking all of these precautions. <laughs> and mind you, the entire time my father, uh, my father believed that social security numbers were the enforcement arm of the mark of the beast. Interesting. But guess what? Do you know how we ate every month? Food stamps? With my mother's social security benefits from disability. Oh. So he essentially allowed his wife to have the mark of the beast so he wouldn't have to work. I was going to ask that. What? How did you make money or how did your family make money? He didn't work? We were poor as frick. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what I'm allowed to say. You can swear. It's okay. <laughs> okay. We were very, very poor. Um, by choice. It really was a poor, poverty by choice because my father refused to get a freaking job. Like my mother was making disability, which is not a lot for a family of six, especially in the States. So I, I can understand my mother cause she couldn't work. Like she physically couldn't, like she, it wasn't like she was abusing the disability payments. It's she physically did not have the capability to work. She was in too much pain just didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and my father believed that he needed to leave the system. And by the way, my father has gone through multiple names and my father was actually arrested 13 times because he loved to brag to me about that. But the reason he was arrested um, 13 times was for things like driving without a license plate, you know, things like that. So just like the, basically the cops were like, really dude, really seriously. So, and he never had any ID on him. So they only could use his alias. So they didn't actually, so nothing is on his actual record. Oh my gosh. There were times where like they, they put him, oh, so this is a little bit off topic, but it's a really funny story. My name is Ella, but my full name is Gabriella. And my father got the inspiration for my name when he was fasting for 28 days in the jail because he refused to eat. This is legit. He refused to eat. And I, I believe he got put in the psych ward. He described it as torture, that they were torturing him. And in this psych ward is where God came to him and told them that he was going to have a daughter named Gabriella. My name comes from a psych ward. So I feel like that's a fun story. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So you move to Mexico and this is within a Mennonite community and it's just these random people joining into this community, which we know from previous interviews with Mennonites that that's not really how it works, that they're, not anyone can just join. So were you kind of... <laughs> I just have so many questions. Were you just living in the house and not really a part of any anything that they were doing? Were you trying to become Mennonite? Was it just like, this is a free place to live? What's going on here? In Mexico, the Mennonites have been there a hundred years. So it wasn't, I was not living in the southern part of Mexico, which would have been like no cars allowed, no nothing. This was like, there were Mennonites who were very old order, and Mennonites who are much more progressive. Uh -huh. So like you wouldn't be able to tell them apart from the, you know, Christian churches. But I lived in an old colony neighborhood. So it, they still had electricity, but like they all wore the very, the very um, conservative dresses. Like the collarbone was covered down to the elbows, down to the ankle. The thing is, is a lot of Mennonites, they speak something called low German in the old order communities, they don't sometimes, a lot of the times, they don't speak anything except that. Mm -hmm. So I ended up getting a job at the pizza place, which was awesome. I loved that job. It was great. I ended up getting a job at a pizza place. It's Mexico. You don't exactly work legally. 
So I got a job at a pizza place and I worked with Mexicans as well as Mennonites. And so at first I, cause I was working on my Spanish. I just kind of hung out with the Mexicans at work. And eventually I made Mennonite friends and they were like, you know what? You're not Mennonite, but like, here you go. The girls from the old order Mennonites, like I legitimately, when I got there to work for the first two days, nobody would look me in the eye and no one would talk to me for the first two days of work. Like it was like, I would literally be asking them like, Hey, like, where can I find the napkins? Like it was all work related. And some of the reason was that they were terrified. They were very confused about me. I also had much shorter hair than this. So they thought I was gay, which was like, ah, <sighs> so scared. I was like, I'm going to give you the cooties, you know? So some of them just really couldn't look at me. Eventually they kind of realized I wasn't a problem. I kind of just stayed out of everybody's way. I made some friends with the more modern Mennonites who I still talk to. They're awesome girls. Um, and I can just say that being a part of a Mennonite community, I will say that some Mennonite people are amazing, but oh my goodness. Wow. Uh, I just can say that there is way, so, way too much abuse mm. within that community. Like I was abused as a child and I think all of the friends that I talked to experienced about the same thing, excluding the thought there being a prophet. It was very common. So I, okay. I lived there for nine months. So you enjoyed your time there? Absolutely hated it. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I loved my job. Mm -hmm. But the thing was, is I was always under pressure that if I didn't do enough of the responsibilities at home, that I was going to lose my job. I was going to be forced to quit. Mm -hmm. Throughout my childhood, my dad has had this homeschooling tactic where essentially all of the children are forced to sit down and watch conspiracy videos for up to six hours. <sighs> so every Sunday, I remember like I worked, I worked almost full time and I was still taking some classes and I worked 12 hour shifts, which is, you know, not normal for a 17 year old to be working, but it was, it was awesome. Loved that job. Yeah. And we didn't do like my siblings, they never left the house unless we were going out to eat or something like that never left the house. I was the only one who ever, we also, we were babysitting their farm animals. In the morning, like I would go, we all had a rotation of who had to deal with it. And so I like would go before work and do some farm chores. And then it wasn't much, but like, before work I'd do farm chores, I'd come back and do farm chores. It's like, and then after that, we would have a one to two hour Bible and prayer session, which is awful. I love my Jesus and I love my Bible, but that was just traumatic in all senses of the word. So like I said, we were very busy. And then on Sundays, I wanted to go out with my friend because some of my friends worked on weekends. They, Sunday they were free. And so I was like, yeah, I'm going to make plans. Like I'm going to go. I talked to my mom about it. And then my dad's like, no, I want you to watch this video. And I'm like, dad, seriously, like I don't ever do anything fun. He's like, this time you can go, but next time between 11 and two, you're not allowed to have plans on Sunday. Actually, I think it was like 10 to, he, first it was like 10 to three. And I'm like, how, why do you need five hours? Yeah. <sighs> so we would sit there and watch either religious videos or conspiracy videos for up to six hours, minimum of two. Oh, what were these videos about specifically? A lot of them was like about Satanism within the United States government. Some of them were about how everyone are really slaves or about how Bill Gates is going to kill everyone with his vaccine. We watched one on marriage, one on family, government, things like that. It was like seminar type thing. Mm -hmm. It was just awful. And my dad, like, so I hated Mexico with a burning passion. So the first three days I got there, I was just in tears, like just straight up tears because it was like, I hate it. I was so happy in Ecuador. Like I was 17. I finally had a group of friends. I had a job. Like I'm so happy. Like I'm finally learning Spanish. Like I had my own room. Like I was living what I thought was the dream. Like he'd be like, it's okay, honey. Like I didn't want to move here either. And I'm like, excuse me. You're the one who chose this. Mm -hmm. You chose to move here. You don't get to complain. I said that kind of jokingly. It was like, 
And he was like, no, I didn't choose to be here. God chose for us to be here. Mm. So anything my father said, it was backed up by God. It wasn't my father speaking. It was God speaking. Right. So if I were to say something that my father didn't like, I was saying something God didn't like. So opposing my father was opposing God. And so we were very Christian. And this goes back to the thing of like the keeping me isolated. I wasn't never allowed to go to church because he didn't want them to essentially teach me to think for myself or to learn different aspects of the Bible. He didn't want me to. So I remember, you see, Carrie Ann's dad is a pastor um, and they had a online church and I decided that I was going to go. So I started attending online church and listening and being like, oh, 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 I'm like, you're not supposed to do this to your kids. They're like, no. I'm like, so my dad isn't God, essentially. Like, I mean, I never thought he was legitimately God, but it was close to that in my subconscious. Mm -hmm. Like I can have my own opinions and I'm not being disrespectful, you know? And they're like, yeah, you know, it's your face, not your dad's. You got to figure out what you believe. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, so I remember I called Carrie Ann up. I was just sobbing. I was like, Carrie Ann, if my father's Christianity is what Christianity is, I'm done with it. I don't care if I'm going to hell, I'm leaving. I can't do it anymore. And that's when I started attending church again. She was like, okay, let's, and then I was able to say, all right, I can deal with this Christianity, but whatever my father was, I, that was, it was just a cult. It, it's so weird now, like, because when someone gets in a disagreement with me, I immediately go, oh, I must be wrong. I'm sorry. Clearly I am the idiot because I just wanted to like hide away and not stir the pot because my father was incredibly emotional and hated logic, like specifically hated it. And he would tell me, he'd be like, all I talk is facts. And I'm like, I don't think you've ever said a fact it's in this entire two hours you've been sh ranting. So there was a lot of that. Also, it was like, I took care of my siblings for years. Like I cooked for them, not all the time, but I was very much like a third parent. Did your whole family move back to Ecuador or did you escape on your own? <sighs> my whole family got to Ecuador and we were there for a total of three weeks, maybe three to four weeks. I went to visit Carrie Ann for two weeks. I convinced my dad to let me go there for two weeks. In which time I got baptized, which wasn't exactly... Like, I remember I came out to my mom as Protestant, which makes no sense to anyone. But my dad thought Protestantism was Satanism. So, like, he would always be like, all oh, these dang Protestants. And I'm like, I am a Protestant. Like, I believe in going to church. I believe in this. And I remember being, like, having a panic attack when I was going to tell my dad that I was a Protestant or that I was going to get baptized. Like, I just immediately, like... <sighs> and he let me get baptized and I went back to my we were on the coast so we were just staying there for a month before we went back to our original town that we had left to Mexico from and I hated it my I was there with my family for a week then I left for two weeks and I remember going back leaving my friend's house thinking I'm making a mistake. And before then they had told me, they said, Gabriella, if you don't want to go back, you don't have to. Like we will take care of you. And I was like, no, it'll be okay. My dad's been getting better. The thing is I already had a place to live that wasn't with my parents in the town where my family lived. Was she was like a grandma to me. Cause I told my mother, I was like, I will never live with you guys again. Never. I don't care if I'm not 18. What can you do? It's Ecuador. I can work. I can support myself. I'd much rather be working full time than be in this house. We were there for another week, in which time my father just like, he had this habit of driving us in to my, his marital spats. So it was basically like a public, a family shaming of my mother. Hmm. 
So like he would tell us how she was being an awful wife and how she was trying to tear apart the family and things like that. And I would defend her. I'd be like, dude, no. And this was the first time my sister, she's two years younger than me. She was kind of fed up. She was very good at not talking, not speaking up. That was the way she dealt with it. But one day she was like, dad, it was this fight. She was like, dad, you aren't making sense. Your reality is not real. You are not thinking clearly. You are being a hypocrite. Like, you know, you're accusing her of attacking you, but here you are. And I just remember being, cause like during that time, like before I had been like the standing up for my siblings, like I was that person, but it was this time where I didn't have it in me anymore. So I just basically huddled in a corner and cried because I couldn't be in the conversation. And my little brother, he was nine. No, yeah, 10. He ran out of the house sobbing. And he was like, I hate dad or something like that. Like, I, and I go to him and I'm like, I will never leave you. Don't worry. I love you. Everything's going to be okay. I gave him a hug and it got to the point where the thing is beforehand, before I knew a fight was coming. So I had actually packed my bags, not all of my things, but just the staples because I had a feeling like I called Carrie Ann and I was like, listen, there's going to be a fight. I don't know. I like, will you be able to come get me? And they were like, yeah. So my mom, she, I was so proud of her. She left my dad. And he was like, I'm not going to let you leave. I'm not going to let you tear apart this family. And she's like, well, I'll call the police. And he was like, oh, <gasps> terrified. So immediately he switched from like trying to hold on to me and my sister, like emotionally to you can't take my sons. You can't take them. It's like he threw me away. He threw me and my sister away, which was, you know, good, but also like, ouch, dad, really? Yeah. Like he threw me away and my brother, my middle brother, he was on my dad's side. He thought my mom was not being a good submissive wife. Ugh. (laughs) And during this time, my littlest brother, he kept, he wasn't sure if he wanted to go or stay. So like, I remember we got in the taxi and he was like, I don't think I'm supposed to leave. I don't think I'm supposed to leave. So we let him out because my mom wasn't going to force us to go with either parent. And then he called us as we were halfway to the hotel saying, no, 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 never mind. Take me back. Take me back. I have a really bad feeling. I am sick to my stomach. Take me back. And we said, we turned around, got him. He was like, I don't know. He goes, as soon as I entered the house, I just felt sick and I don't know. And I'm like, it's okay. And I told my mom, I was like, all right. So the next day I called Carrie and I was like, come get me. I need to leave. And my mom was like, no, I want to go back to my town. And I was like, well, you know what, mom? I'm not. I told her I would be gone for two weeks. And then as time went on, I got more and more. My PTSD really flared up because I finally was in a safe place that it was like I was able to let my guard down enough to where it was like I was a wreck. I basically ended up having to call my mom. Just mind you, I'm still not 18 yet at that point. And I said, I'm not coming back because guess what? My mom, a week after being separated from my dad, she took him back. I was like, really? Because she said that she would have at least a three month separation before and she moved in within a week. Hmm. I was so pissed because it was like, you betrayed me. I finally thought you were standing up for me and standing up for your kids. And you went back. Just completely broke my trust. And so I said, I'm not coming back. I'm not going. I can't. I went back for my brother's birthday, my youngest brother. I didn't tell anyone except like my mom that I was going because it was just going to be quick. And my Carrie Ann's parents came with me to support me and keep me safe because And I got to the park where my little brother was having his birthday party and he runs up to me, gives me this big hug and he goes, but his first reaction is go, Gabriella, why are you here? Dad thinks you're going to stay. Why are you here? I told you not to come immediately. Like, Oh my goodness. He was just really scared that I wasn't going to be allowed to leave, that I was going to be forced to stay. 
And I was, that whole party, like my dad followed me around and was like trying to talk to me and whisper to me. It was making me sick. Like I was panicking, right? And I kept avoiding him. He was like, can we talk? And I was like, no, <laughs> I walked away. I went to my house with my chaperones to make sure I could get out of the house again to gather my things, gather my stuff. I never realized how screwed up my childhood was until I talk about it as factually as I can. And it's like, oh, oops, <laughs> okay. So I saw my dad for that was the last time I saw him and I left. Eventually, my mom found out that he was married while he married her. He wasn't divorced, like he said. So my mother, under her religious morals, she realized we're not married, we can't live together. So she kicked them out. Oh. At first I was like, my mom called me and she was like, you're a bastard. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> I'm like, mom, this is the best freaking news I could have ever received. I was like jumping up and down with joy. She didn't call me a bastard, I did. So I'm like, mom, so I'm a bastard? And she's like, yeah, uh-huh. I'm like, yes, yes. Wait, why, why were you excited about that? Because it meant that my mother, under her religious principles, could leave. Okay. And that it would be morally wrong of her not to. Because she wasn't married and was in Christian culture, you don't live with someone you're not married to. And considering I would have been born out of wedlock would have made me a bastard. I was very happy about this. I was like, yes, yes. And it was the greatest moment, which is sad to say, you know, it's like the best news is being told I'm a bastard. The thing is, is my mother, she was abusive in her own ways, like just very manipulative and diet related, like not as in fat, but just as in health and and her part that she played with my abuse was explaining it, that it wasn't abuse and it was okay. Mm. So yes, my mother as well was abusive, but I also recognize that she was in a abusive marriage for 20 years. Yeah. And so at one part, it's like, I understand how she got there, but I still have to give her responsibility because she was the adult in the situation. And she allowed us to be treated like that. But I still have a relationship with my mother. It is strained because I told her, I was like, mom, I don't trust you. I don't. It was especially because like, I told my mom, I was like, mom, ever since I was six years old, I have told you the right thing to do. Like, I just remember like being as young as six, being like, mom, I don't think this is a good idea. And she would come back, she'd be, do it anyway and come back and be like, yeah, you were right. And it was throughout the whole time. And I would tell my mom, mom, this is an abusive marriage. Mom, this is bad. Mom, do this. And I know, you know, easier said than done. It would always come back to, no, Gabriella, stop it. You're overreacting. And then eventually it was, oh, you're right. She would always end up doing what I said just way later. And it was like, really, mom, come on. Yeah. I told you. And she's like, I know. And I'm like, uh-huh. I was like, because I, I was like crying. My mom I was like, mom, I felt so alone. Like I was the only one who knew this was wrong. But my littlest brother, he definitely recognized it was wrong way ahead of us. Uh, well, at least in timeline, like I knew it was wrong first, but that, but I was like 14, 15 before I realized it. And he was like eight. The only reason I knew first was because I was older. And so I decided to stay. I got my friends got me, brought me on a bus and I stayed and truly it has been some of the best and worst times of my life. I visit my siblings sometimes. It's very hard for me to be in the town where they live just because I get very triggered. And it was nice because I, I had a therapist reach out to me and say, Hey, I think you need help. How can I help you? And that's where I found out that I had depression and anxiety and PTSD and OCD and all of these things. And I'm like, Oh, I am eternally screwed up. And so I got into this very, with the healing processes, I get very, angry but the issue that i have is i my father and my mother they always use their anger 
and they would let it control them. So I was, I decided as a young girl, well, when more, when I was older, it was, I don't want to be this angry. So I decided that I wasn't going to be. And I didn't know that you could still feel anger without being violent or damaging. Mm. So I just kind of buried it. And so lately it's been a thing of like, all right, how can I use this anger productively? How can I make things better for people? And that's why I decided to reach out because it's like, I can channel my FU energy (laughs) into into spreading awareness. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. Well, it was really brave of you to reach out and decide to share your story. You mentioned in your submission to us that through the channel, you were able to recognize certain things that were abusive. And I'm just so happy to hear that that was helpful for you. It was so helpful because I started like watching it every time you released a video. And especially with the How to Train Up Your Child book, like Kendra, the interview with Kendra. Yeah. The... Well, almost all of the interviews, I was like, oh, yeah. Like, I remember my dad saying, like, he said cults aren't bad because cults just mean follower of one. And so technically we're a cult, but that's not a bad thing. Mm. So I'm like, oh. Or <laughs> well, really the control aspect, like all of the different techniques they use. I now have a thing. Like, I think I heard this from your channel. It was like, if you want to know if it's a cult, try to leave. And so yeah. that is my new mentality. I believe I heard it on this channel. If, if it's not a cult, I can leave. And I just started doing like family history and I realized I was like, oh my goodness, it was legitimately a cult. And it also like, I had to be sat down by my like, by Carrie Ann's dad. And he goes, Gabriella, what you're going through right now is a lot of the things that someone who left a cult would be going through. I'm like, really? And he's like, yes. And so after a few months of being like, oh, oh, I was. And believe it or not, my entire childhood, I was obsessed with cults and would research them. <laughs> That's how easy it is to not know you're in a cult. You can literally research cults for years and never realize you're in a cult. Yeah, that's one of the easiest things is to recognize the cult manipulation tactics in other groups, but to not see it in yourself, because especially with you growing up very isolated, that was your reality. And so it's hard to really question that. It's yeah, we tell people all the time when they're like, how dumb can you be to join a cult? It drives me crazy because it's so much more complicated and the manipulation that goes into that, the, the outright saying Yes, we are a cult, but then telling you why it's not bad is also a very common tactic so that when someone approaches you and says you're in a cult, you're like, yes, I am. And it's fine because X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Because it's not jarring when they tell you what people are going to say about you because you already expect it to happen. That's the same with Mormonism, the things that they would tell us. And so when someone approaches you with it, you're like... I already know that that thing, that's not real or whatever it is that they tell you to respond with, but they don't tell you how to critically think for yourself. And they discourage critical thinking and logic like you've been mentioning. They really do. Because that would mean that you could start to draw the parallels and say, wait, they were controlling my behavior, the information I was allowed to ingest, my thoughts were monitored, or I was supposed to monitor my own thoughts. You talked about the compulsive confessions because of your thoughts. And then the emotional control where they manipulate you and and make you think if you leave, you will like that video. I can't believe that he showed you like a Satanist video and said, if you go to public school, that's what's going to happen to you. That's just yeah. hugely emotionally manipulative. And I'm just so glad that you were able to get out of that. Yeah. I am so, I am so glad. Like this is the first time in my whole life that I wake up in the morning and I'm still depressed. Like, don't get me wrong, but I wake up in the morning and I'm like, thank you God for I'm alive and I don't hate 
everything anymore. Like I, this is the first time in my life where I look forward to the present and I don't have to put myself in the future of what one day will be because I like my life yeah. now and I've never had that. And it's also the first time where I can cry and not be seen as weak. I can be dysfunctional yeah. and my essentially adopted family, they understand and they want to be there to support me and they are okay that I'm not okay and they don't expect me to be okay. And that has been so very appreciated and I can't just say just, I'm so grateful to be out and be alive and I'm glad I put a semicolon. I'm glad there was a semicolon instead of a period in my life. If that makes sense. Yeah. And what you mentioned about the family who's taking care of you, I'm so happy that you have them. That's incredible. The it's okay to not be okay because this is a journey and you haven't been out that long and you are discovering new things and and how it affected you and things are still going to come up and that's okay. I think that's the biggest thing that I want to make sure that you know is that when you leave something, it's amazing to physically remove yourself from that environment if possible. And it's amazing that you have these people who can help you and knowing that it's going to take a while. It's it's a process to unwind those mentalities, to retrain your brain to think a different way, to notice those thoughts when they come up. If you do feel like, am I being scrupulous with this confession? Or is it something that I really need to feel guilty about? Or is it something that I was taught to feel guilty about? And all of that stuff is going to come up and it's going to be hard. But I love that you know that it's okay that it will be a journey and that it's going to take some time and that you have a support system. Yes. I, because like, I'll find myself because my father told me something like, if you leave the protection of your father, God will not protect you. Hmm. Like that was one of the things and that's terrifying. And so there are so many times where I get scared and I'm like, if something goes wrong, I'm like, maybe because God isn't protecting me anymore because I left home. Right. It happens less. It's honestly more of a subconscious thing now. But like, I will get like, what if I'm doing the wrong thing? And so when it comes down to that, I have to take a step back and I have to say, who's thinking this thought? Because is this me? Is it my mental disorder? Or is it... Um, my dad, because like it's all me, but like who is influencing my thoughts right now? Yeah. What is influencing? Like obviously it's all my thoughts, but what is the influencer of this? And sometimes I try to look at things objectively, like from afar and be like, okay, if this were a friend or a stranger, what would my emotional and logical reaction be to it? Like, what would I say? And I'm like, okay, no, this is wrong. Or no, this is something like I lied. I shouldn't do that. Like, I don't have to lie. Cause like sometimes I compulsively lie just because you had to be safe. And so I have to check myself and be like, nope, sorry. That's not what I meant. That came out wrong. Yeah. And how are you doing now? I mean, it's it hasn't been that long. Do you need anything? Are you okay? <laughs> like, how how can we support you? <laughs> Honestly, the biggest support I can have is a platform that allows me to share my story because I was told my whole life to shut up. Mm. And so by me doing this, this is essentially the biggest F you to my dad I could give. And another something I'm working on, because I never had any documents. I don't, my birth certificate was canceled because I did get a passport because they filed for a delayed birth certificate. But because my father filed it improperly, they canceled it. It's real. It's legit. I called the peoples, though I can't get a social security number. I have a passport because uh, I was able to get it while I still had a valid birth certificate. Okay. But now it's like I don't have any documentation. So I've been trying to figure out how I can get that. But every 
office that I've called, like social security department, the vital health records. They're like, we don't know what to do with you. Okay. That's one of the reasons I'm still in Ecuador because I can't legally work in the U.S. But your goal is to move back to the U.S.? Yes. Okay. So if anyone listening knows how to help Ella with this, please leave it in the comments below or you can email me at cults to consciousness at gmail.com so we can help her get back to the States if that's where she wants to be. And I, I really want to say how much I appreciate your channel and what you're doing to spread awareness to all of these high control groups and these cults because it really is invaluable. And so thank you. Yeah. It makes me so happy to know that it's been helpful in your deconstruction process. And wow, yeah, when you said you just left six, seven months ago and the channel is helpful, it's like, oh my gosh, this is wild to me. Like, I, I guess I know through messages and comments that people are being affected through the channel. Um, but to really talk to someone who's been able to go through that journey and and find value in this. It's really valuable for us and it helps me keep going because, you know, this work is hard listening to these stories and it's so important though. And I want to make sure that people do have a voice and they have a place to share. And so I'm just really happy that you reached out. So thank you. Thank you. I, thank you for allowing me to say it. Yeah. I need your Linda Listen moment. Your sassy statement as the okay. video with the toddler goes or sassy inspiration. Statement. Oh my goodness. I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> All right. So my Linda listen is if you are unsure if it's a cult, try and leave, try and think for yourself, say something that isn't accepted. And if how based upon that reaction, you're going to know if that's healthy because anyone that tells you not to think clearly doesn't have your best interest in mind. Amen to that. I love it. It's a great Linda listen. And we are going to keep you a little bit more anonymous per your request. So if you guys, again, have any comments for Ella, leave them in the comment section below. Or if you have ways that you can support her, you can email me, as I mentioned. And thank you just so much for coming on. Do you have any more final thoughts before we go? Um, no. I mean, there's always a lot to a story, but I think that for this um, episode that we're pretty good. Great. Oh, I'm just so happy you came on. Okay. So guys, thank you for watching. Again, leave those comments below for Ella. If you want to support the podcast, we have our merch. We actually just yesterday released a holiday line of knit sweaters, which I thought were pretty cute. I had fun designing them. So <laughs> you can find that at cultstoconsciousness.com under our merch page. A few different options there. We also just released, as I mentioned earlier, our first C2C vacation, which you can now book. You can find that link in the description below. We're going to Costa Rica together. And if you want to become a patron, you can do that. So I have a list here. Barbara and Brayden, you joined at the highest tier, $40 a month. And I'm just so grateful and happy. Thank you so much for doing that and supporting in such a big way. We also have Kate, Bobby, and Rebecca. Thank you also for joining and supporting. It really means a lot. And if you guys like this video, I'll leave two more here down below that you may want to check out. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious, and be well.